Hello everyone and welcome back to part 2 of my top 10 games I played in 2014 list. I don't have a big lengthy intro this time so I'm just going to get right into things. So let's start where we last left off with number 5. Shovel Knight is the most video gamey game I've ever played. What started out as a small indie game project funded via Kickstarter quickly grew into one of the best games released in 2014. Shovel Knight's smart gameplay design proves that retro style platformers are far from dead, but unlike many other indie games it doesn't rely on nostalgia to win over its audience. It finds inspiration from many sources, like Zelda 2, Mega Man, Mario, Castlevania, Dark Souls, and even a bit of internet culture. It even takes the sole good idea that the old developers of that DuckTales game had. Shovel Knight doesn't really do anything incredibly innovative or fresh, but instead takes many common gameplay elements and tunes them to a level of near perfection. The end result is a game that feels familiar yet manages to form its own identity, and the charming art design and quirky writing also help in that regard. The game isn't incredibly long, but playtime can be extended by hunting down the collectibles or going through the game's New Game Plus mode. The soundtrack is full of amazing songs, and it really adds to the game's high spirit in nature. And maybe it's just because I'm a big, dumb, emotional baby, but holy shit that ending really hit me in a place. I think most impressive of all, however, is that this is developer Yacht Club Games' first release. I'm looking forward to their future projects, because Shovel Knight is proof enough that they know how to make an incredible game. Persona Q is my most anticipated game for 2014. I'm happy that I'm able to say it not only lived up to my hype, but far exceeded it. I'm not going to beat around the bush with this one. From what I've played, I think Persona Q takes the spot for my favorite Persona game. I was expecting this game to be good, sure, but prior to its release I had a lingering fear that it would be a half-baked attempt to get Persona fans to try out an Etrian Odyssey style game. Thankfully, Persona Q is just the opposite. There is enough here to satisfy both fans of Etrian Odyssey and fans of Persona. Thinking about it more, it's quite genius, really. Take Persona, which has great writing and characters but has fairly unimpressive combat as far as Atlas games go, and then take Etrian Odyssey, which has in-depth and well-balanced combat mechanics and dungeon crawling, but virtually no story worth note, then put them in a room together, dim the lights, put on the mood music, and you get the perfect love child of the two. Sure, fans of either series will probably say things like Persona Q's gameplay isn't as good as other Etrians, or that the story isn't as good as other Personas, but I sincerely believe that the two franchises cross over well enough to cover up one another's weaknesses. At its core, the game really is just another Etrian Odyssey with a Persona coat of paint on it, but that is not by any means a bad thing. The soundtrack has a mix of both familiar and new songs, and overall does its job well. Personally, I think that the P3 version of Light the Fire Up in the Night is the best Persona battle theme we've heard yet. The art style, while probably chosen due to the 3DS's technical limitations, is done pretty well and in classic Persona tradition the menus look stylish as fuck. What I love most about this game, however, is that it's really fucking hard if you want it to be. Difficulty is something I really appreciate in not only Mega Ten, but games as a whole. I find nothing more satisfying than overcoming a challenging obstacle through skill and proper strategy. And while I don't think that all games need to be difficult to be good, I find myself more engaged in a game when I struggle through them and have the character's hardships become my own. It's a type of connection that transcends simple narrative techniques and something that really makes video games stand out as a medium in my eyes. So after recent Mega Ten entries have failed to deliver in that regard, I absolutely fell in love with Persona Q's Risky Mode. I hope that future Megami Tensei releases learn from the style of difficulty selection and provide people like me with the mode that offers a challenge while also keeping easier modes around to remain accessible to new players. As far as story goes, many cutscenes take a comedic, lighthearted tone with the humor often being hit or miss, but there's quite a few gems in there like I guess unironically saying the phrase, you bet you're sweet bippy I am in a side quest. Without spoiling anything, I will say that Persona Q can be serious when it wants to be, and to great effect. As I said previously when talking about Persona 4, the modern Persona games are built around central themes such as death or truth. 
Persona Q's theme is a bit more loose and definitely not explored as in-depth, but ties in nicely to the game's fundamental structure. Persona Q's theme can be found in the title of the game's opening song, Maze of Life. Much like the dungeons the party explores, life is a maze and you never truly know what lies ahead. Sometimes, you just need to go with the flow and let life happen, which is reflected in the wonderful quote the game opens up with. I find this quote not only representative of the game's story, but Persona Q is a product. Sure, the premise of the game may seem stupid to many, but if you go along with it and keep an open mind, you'll find that Persona Q is a game worth playing through. Nocturne is a game with a lot to say using as few words as possible. It's a game about destiny, humanity, free will, power, and much more. Nocturne is the point in Mega Ten history where fans draw the line between modern style Mega Ten and the classic games, and for good reason. Nocturne was a game changer. The six slot party was streamlined down to four, demons no longer required money to summon or magnetite to walk around with, and traditional equipment was replaced with a new system called Megatama, accessories that not only affected your stats, but also your strengths, weaknesses, and skills as well. But most important of all, however, were the changes to the combat. Nocturne was the first game to introduce the famous press turn system. Press turn takes traditional RPG combat and amplifies it into a high-risk, high-reward affair. When weaknesses are hit, it's incredibly devastating. Missing or having your attack absorbed or reflected become strategy-halting barriers that the player needs to work their way around. Buffs and debuffs become crucial, and intelligent skill selection is necessary for survival. All of these elements combine to make press turn feel fresh and intuitive compared to the slower gameplay systems most other RPGs use, and it was an important step in Mega Ten branching itself out and forming its own identity. Press turn's flexible nature combined with the Megatama system and an abundance of demons to fuse guarantee that no two playthroughs of Nocturne will be the same. Sure, some skills are better than others, and if you go for one of the game's endings you're going to need a fairly specific character build, but your constantly changing party of demons alone keep things feeling satisfyingly customizable. The only areas of the gameplay that I find lacking are things that I only have a problem with because Nocturne is an older game, and its sequels streamlined its ideas. The sole issue I have with the gameplay that isn't due to its age are the pricing modifiers in the game's hard mode, which make the game's flow come to an abrupt halt at the very end of the game, as you need to grind for at least a couple hours to get the stuff from shops that you want due to the outrageous prices. Speaking of hard mode, holy shit is it well balanced. The game provides a decent challenge on normal, but hard mode is extremely punishing. It's not the most difficult Mega Ten experience by any means, but I think Nocturne's hard mode lands in a perfect area in which it never becomes so hard to the point of frustration or boredom, but is difficult enough to keep you constantly engaged and coming back for more. Nocturne's soundtrack is my personal favorite as far as Mega Ten goes, and I think that it's some of Shoji Meguro's best work. The story, in traditional SMT mainline style, is quite minimalistic, but you'd be wrong if you said it was weak. Taking place in a bizarre landscape known as the Vortex World, the survivors of an apocalyptic event known as the Conception fight for the right to create a new world. This fascinating premise provides more than enough groundwork for telling a captivating story full of commentary about humanity. Though the two ideologies are still important to the plot, Nocturne somewhat abandons the law and chaos alignment system found in SMT 1 and 2 for a more character-based alignment system. Almost every member of the cast has an idea for how the world should be, and it's interesting seeing how each of them come to their conclusions and just how far they'll go to obtain the power they need to make said world a reality. 
Admittedly, I think Nocturne has rather weak characters compared to the other mainline games, but seeing them lose their sanity and become your adversaries is as tragic and entertaining as ever. The minimalistic storytelling approach makes every bit of dialogue and every action taken in the story all the more impactful. Complementary to all of this is the game's surreal atmosphere. The Vortex world is a fucked up place, and every new area you encounter will show you why. The harsh combat, small cast of characters, and dark atmosphere make you feel very lonely, but also adds a sense of urgency and importance to your quest. A few years ago, I once heard someone describe Nocturne as the silent god of JRPGs, and while I think that's a bit overdramatic, I can see where they're coming from. Nocturne's mastery of gameplay and atmosphere is something that games today still struggle to match. Despite its age, Nocturne is still one of the best Megami Tensei games ever made. Oh, and it features Dante from the Devil May Cry series. It's funny how a lot of the same things I praise Nocturne for also apply to Dark Souls. Strangely enough, this was actually a game I bought not too long after it came out, but the reason I have it on this list was because I was finally able to put down the time to finish my original run not too long ago. Despite what you might be thinking, the reason I took so long to beat this game isn't because of its difficulty. From the get-go, Dark Souls was a game I wanted to savor every moment of. I actually refused to play this game unless I had a large chunk of time that I could dedicate to it and I had a habit of making new characters just to try out new things and explore different strategies that I couldn't do with my main profile. And I enjoyed every minute of it. This game's combat is actually fairly basic. You have two stances, two attack types for each stance, items, spells, and a few movement options. After you learn the basics, there aren't too many added factors that Dark Souls throws at you. With enough patience, it's a game that anyone can find success in. And boy, is that success rewarding. You aren't given too much room for error, and as the game's tagline promises, you should be prepared to die. A lot. But with each death comes a valuable experience that you can learn from, and you can use that experience to overcome your obstacles that the game throws at you. Just like in Nocturne, you have a variety of ways to play through the game and there's a lot of room for customization. The game's story seems almost non-existent at first, but can be found through item descriptions and clever level design. The lore surrounding the Dark Souls world offers a lot of room for speculation and discussion, which the internet has had a field day with. Speaking of the internet, Dark Souls makes great use of online multiplayer in a non-traditional way. In truth, Dark Souls is the kind of game that I always hoped MMORPGs would be like, but never were. It's a mostly single-player experience, but at any given moment you can team up with other players if you choose to do so, and you run the risk of having other players hunt you down so that you can have a duel to the death. At the time it came out, Dark Souls proved that you can have a mainstream game come out and be profitable without dumbing down the difficulty, something that I think is incredibly significant to the history of the video game medium as a whole. In the past few years, we've been seeing more and more games take inspiration from this game's design cues, and I think that the industry as a whole is better for it. While the game's second half takes a slight dip in quality compared to the first half, I think it's safe to say that Dark Souls is a masterpiece in terms of smart gameplay design. Rend, slaughter, devour your enemies. There is no other way to survive. You cannot escape your hunger. Warriors of Purgatory. I'm including both Digital Devil Saga 1 and 2 as one game because they really aren't meant to be enjoyed as separate experiences. The two games combined tell an incredible story of a small tribe of emotionless soldiers in a strange world that suddenly gained the ability to transform into cannibalistic demons. I absolutely fell in love with the main cast, and by the time the second game finished I realized that I had a rather large emotional investment in all of them, even some of the ones I originally couldn't stand. 
It's easy to say that Digital Devil Saga is just a game about people that turn into demons, but it's so much more than that. It's a game that explores what it means to be human, what it means to feel emotion, the evil that humans can commit, and how to atone for not only your mistakes, but for the mistakes of your fellow man. Digital Devil Saga is what happens when you take a more traditional narrative approach to Megaton, and it works shockingly well. The well-rounded characters interacting within the constant action and drama of the plot make for a story like no other, and it blows almost every other game story I've ever experienced out of the water. No, seriously. Fuck mainline SMT, fuck Persona, fuck everything. Digital Devil Saga, in my opinion, is not only the peak of Atlas's PS2 era releases, but Atlas's games as a whole. And yes, while I still consider Devil Survivor 2 my favorite megaton, I do believe that from an objective quality standpoint that Digital Devil Saga 1 and 2 surpass it. I think the moment when I realized DDS was something special came from a cutscene that occurs around the halfway point of the first game. It's fairly short, but it's gone on to become one of my favorite story scenes in any game. Do you realize we could share the same fate as them? We all hate, we all fight, we all devour just to survive, but eventually we'll die. I couldn't defend myself. We aren't any different from him. What's the point then? Why live like this? Why are we even alive? Sir, tell me. The choice at the end of this scene actually doesn't affect anything in the game, you're just trying to help a close friend through a hard time. The raw emotion Argilla displays in this scene alone really shows how hard the characters have it, and you can't help but want to see their story through to the end. As far as gameplay goes, I actually don't have too much to talk about, but I do think that DDS has the best usage of press turn found in the entire series. Shield skills make it so that defensive strategies are just as viable as offensive strategies, and I really enjoy that. The game's mantra system allows for an amount of customization that no other Mega Ten has ever matched. Digital Devil Saga is a story about people that have done horrible things, but it also carries a strong inspirational message that will stick with me forever. No matter how bad things are, and no matter how badly you've screwed up, if you have enough courage and hope, you can become a better person and make the world a better place. So that's my 2014 Gipti list. A bit different from my usual content, but I really enjoyed how it turned out, and would also like to know if you guys enjoyed it as well. This was really fun to make, and I wouldn't be against doing another list at the end of 2015. Speaking of 2015, I guess I'll use this time to talk about the games I'm looking forward to. First of all, there's Majora's Mask 3D, which I already pre-ordered the limited edition of because I want that awesome Skull Kid statue. Second, Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, looks downright incredible, and even though I only thought Ground Zeroes was okay, I absolutely loved the gameplay and enjoyed the story beats that they set up for Phantom Pain. We don't know too much about Persona 5 yet, but I think it's safe to say that it's going to turn out good. And, of course, there's one other game I'm pretty excited about.